What are the reasons for the Great Resignation? In October of 2021, the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics announced that 4.3 million Americans, almost 3% of the entire workforce, quit their jobs in August. That was just one month, August. Now, the U.K. and Australia are bracing for a similar wave. Both my husband and myself have been a part of this, and we know many others who have as well. Is this some kind of cosmic shift, some kind of YOLO wave of enlightenment grasping for a better quality of life? Or is this a result of declining work ethic combined with government handouts during quarantine? My next guest has logged over 20 years as a headhunter in Florida and has daily conversations with both business owners and employees of one of the industries impacted the most by this shift, hospitality. Today, he's going to talk about his observations as a hospitality headhunter and the potential perspective, insight, and lessons that we can all learn from whatever might be next. Pandemic YouTuber, immensely efficient, LinkedIn legend, Jeremy Nichols. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Very excited. I'm glad to have you. And um, we met over quarantine, so it's only fitting that now we talk <laughs> about the effects of, you know, of employment and the workforce post quarantine. Yeah. So, so what, my, a, what a roller coaster, right? It's such a roller coaster. And I'm curious when you first, when did you first start to notice that people were leaving their jobs? Okay. So Florida is a lot different than the most, most of the country. So we kind of had a head start on everything and I was warning people, gosh, it must've been Q1 21 when things started getting a little batty and, um, you know, colleagues and recruiters in the industry, uh, across the country, were seeing what's going on in Florida. And I'm telling them like, don't worry. Cause Florida is like the opposite when it comes to hiring. Cause our season is Q1, Q2 and everybody else is three and four. Uh, so I, I noticed it super early and I was trying to tell people buckle up and it, it's just getting crazier. It's just getting crazier. It hasn't stopped. So now we're going to Q1 22 and I'm still having these conversations. It's, it's been going on for a while. Is it people in all generations or is this, is people leaving their jobs specific to an age group? It's across the board. I mean, and, and I'm talking my industry specific. So like I have friends and colleagues who are recruiters in, you know, pharmaceutical or Salesforce and uh, medical, and they're having the same issues. But when I'm giving you my intel, this is coming from hospitality, which is a huge, a huge sector anyway, but um, it's, it's all demographics. Yeah, that's funny that you bring up pharmaceutical right away, because um, although your industry is hospitality, and certainly many of us in the state of Florida have are impacted by that, right? Um, because it provides so many jobs. But when I was doing research for our episode, I got so much feedback from people who used to work in a medical aspect and specifically pharmacy stating that burnout was their reason for leaving. Have you observe that that is up there in the top three reasons, would you say? You want to talk? Uh, so just talk um, across most industries right now? Well, I know that um, from a professional standpoint, you can only comment about hospitality, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure people talk to you about this subject frequently. So any insight yeah. that you would give is welcomed. Um, I mean, the main reason I'm seeing it in my industry, I mean, I know for uh, like my wife, for instance, she, she's a good example. She was an RN at Tampa General Hospital in ICU for like 15 years and she left and she's working a remote job now as as a, a nurse, but, you know, in transition, transition care nurse um, in hospitality. There's a lot of reasons why people left. I mean, the industry is notorious for just underpaying people and working a ton of hours and they got away with it for a long time because people were complacent in their jobs or they they just felt like they needed that paycheck to survive i think what covid did was just injected steroids in their thought process of what they were always thinking and what they wanted to get out of life and they were like you know the majority of my industry was kicked out <laughs> like when i think it was like 
gosh, March nine, March 2020, when I saw all my searches just go away. And what that what happened in my industry at that time was everybody from VP down, not really C suite, but from VP area directors and management down were furloughed and let go. And no one even knew what a furlough was right? <laughs> like yeah. at the time, right? Like yeah. nobody knew. And now, now it's like a common word. It's like funny that I'm even saying it now because it's so common. But at the time, no one really knew what it was. And they were let go. And um, nobody knew when, like when was they were going to come back. So it kept on getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And we're looking at a year for some people. Some people, you know, in advance and conference sales and maybe even international sales in, in the hospitality industry are still kind of looking. But most the demand is back and they had so much time to spend with their families and, and raise their kids and they figured out how to make it work. I think, and I know I'm kind of rambling, but this is, it all comes together. Um, there's a lot of different pieces on why people are leaving, but the main reason is that I think they feel comfortable now making that decision where they didn't at the time because they were forced to get rid of their second car. They were forced to get rid of daycare and watch their child. They were forced to cut out cable and make ends meet. So, and then they figured out how to hustle and they got gig work and side jobs. Ah. And then they, and they figured it out. That's the main chunk, you know, cause my industry in hospitality, it's a lot of people who fell into the industry. And they have side passions, side love, side side things they like to do, right? And this afforded them the opportunity, the ones that were really strong and had that entrepreneurial spirit or just hard workers and multitaskers, they, fig they figured it out. And a lot of them are not coming back. So that's a, a big swath. Then there's the burnout, like you're talking about, the people who did not get laid off, right? The ones that were at the restaurants dur during the whole thing or at the hotels, they what do they do they like ate up all those hours so the people that were gone you now you have c-suite and leadership that are looking at the numbers and saying well we're making it work with less people uh, let's just keep it going so like the people that are there are now working a million jobs like hr hrds huh you know human resource directors used to have coordinators training managers uh, HR managers, payroll, you know, all these different like management that reported to them and they were let go and they absorbed all those roles and had to go clean rooms and had to do front desk, you know, and like in restaurants, you know, uh, the general managers, some of them were let go or restaurant managers were let go. And then the area directors came down and oversaw their restaurants. And like, so now they're sick of it. <laughs> like they can only do so much. So they're tired. And they're understaffed and they can't even find hourly work. So like, there's just so much to unpack here. Right. Yeah. That is so interesting. Um, I, I didn't expect that answer at all. I mean, you really brought oh. it together. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, <laughs> I see the individual puzzle pieces, but I don't have the perspective of looking above those puzzle pieces down to see how they make sense. So yeah. for your job as a headhunter, in my imagination, at least, people who own hotel chains, for example, would call you and say, we need these positions filled, find us people. Yeah. I'm curious because you stated that there was essentially uh, employer abuse happening to these employees. They're not just being overworked, but they're just, the, the work environment is hostile. Yeah, it's tough. From your conversations with those employers, do you think they get it? Or are they baffled? A lot of them do. And there's been a lot of come to Jesus moments and aha conversations. Yeah. Like my role has thankfully turned into with a lot of with a lot of my clients has evolved into more of a partnership. And I have the opportunity now, now that I have so much business. And if anybody follows me on LinkedIn knows that I'm very blunt about the market and I'll say what I'm saying here to two potential clients and partners, um, because at this moment, like I, I'm not going to fill the role anyway. Like if they're, if they're not a good employer, I don't want to, I don't want to work for you or work with you anyway. Right. right. That that's kind of like, that's where I'm at. So, uh, I have thankfully talked to leaders and owners and, and managing operators about, 
what's going on and telling them what I'm hearing from candidates and, they, and they're taking it in. That's why you're seeing salary increases right now. You're seeing sign on bonuses, small independent restaurants or properties that can't afford health care are now saying, well, find out what it costs and tell me and then I will pay for it individually for the management because I, I hire management. I don't hire um, hourly. I do like management and up. So C-suite directors management and they'll tell me like if <laughs> I'll tell them you need to have health and dental. Well, I don't have it because I'm a small independent property. I can't, you know, we, we, we can't afford that. Well, you, you're going you're gonna to need it if you're going to want to have management. So now they're telling me, well, we'll we'll take care of it. We'll stipend it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. They're talking about PTO a lot now. Um, hours are huge. Uh, I think I mentioned to you on our conversation before, like in my industry, like the hours you work, was like a badge of honor. Yeah, I grew up. I grew up in that, you know. Yeah, and I, and I I was ignorant to that, and you know I've learned my lesson, you know, later in my career. But yeah, so talk I, to me about that because basically you're describing workplace culture where the American badge of honor of busyness combines with the, you know. Um, uh, I don't know what to call it. capitalism, you know, um, efforts will work every hour we can and we make our workers work every minute of that hour that we can. So is that changing? What are you seeing? Yeah, a little, a little bit. Uh, the hour converse, the hours conversation is something I have with every single intake call I have. We, I, I do, it's called an intake call. So like if you call me and you say, Hey, I, I have a need for a director of engineering at my hotel property on the beach. I'll say, okay, you know, let's sign the agreement first and we'll agree to the agreement. And then I'll say, okay, now we have to schedule an intake call so I can hear a little bit more about the position. And I want to dig in a lot about, you know, what you're offering and tell you what I'm hearing, right? So then we'll do the intake call. And during those intake calls, we talk about hours a lot. And if I hear anything that is like egregious or over the top, I'll say it and I'll walk if I can't fill that. Like, for instance, if someone says, hey, I'm looking for an executive chef at my restaurant, they need to be doing 70, 80 hours a week. I mean, Whoa. That, is, that, is that, that that's, that's the normal. Yeah. That's, that's real. Like normal. Oh, my that's gosh. That's real. Yeah. Chefs. And I'll say, okay, that's very 2019 <laughs> before. <laughs> but I don't know, like, what chef stood on the mountaintop this year and announce to all the other SUs and CBCs and ECs in the chef world and said, look, we are not gonna take it anymore. We're only gonna do this many hours. This is their salary, but their salaries have increased at least 10K, at least bare minimum of anything that they were doing in, in 2019. And their hours, they will not take it anymore. Like I've hired chefs that you know came in and then they found out the work week was 75 hour work week and they left. That I mean, they're used to doing those many hours. They're used to doing in our industry. We call them clopins. Have you ever heard of that? Never. Yeah, close open. Oh, okay. Clo clopin, close open. You know. Uh, yeah. See, I've never clopins. really like subscribed to this "I live to work" mentality. So uh, it's just so hard for me to understand and relate to that at all and it's real yeah it's real and it's i grew up in it i'll tell you how brutal it is if you don't mind no uh, tell me tell serious. me it's, like, it's it's no joke and i i was part of it i don't i don't anymore i'm completely like opposite of that now but like when i grew up in the industry and i was in new york city and then i moved to, before i was here and then i moved to florida but it was like if you're not doing 55 hours a week you're not working period and people would say that like that was like a common thing you're not working you're not working if you're not on property or at the restaurant or at your store you're not you're not working remote hot forget about it you're not working like like that was like a that's a thing 70 hours great you're a hard worker you're a hustler Jeez. right like that was like that that's like how you were judged and it's it's a it's a real it's a real thing and that's like the old school mentality in in our industry and I have I have zero pushback when I say this to potential clients. I'll say that to them when I'm talking about like, hey, you got to look at your hours. I get it. I come from that mentality, but it, it's not cutting it anymore. You're 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 gonna have burnout. No one's gonna be there. If you want to run your operation, you have to figure it out. You have to cut your Mondays, like chop Mondays away. 
or or close earlier or or close between after lunch to dinner. I don't know, but figure it out because you're gonna you're you're you're, you're gonna lose your team. It's so fascinating how you were describing that employees figured it out because they were forced <laughs> yeah. to, and that yeah. really unexpectedly the employees figuring it out is forcing the employers to figure it out, which is not that position of power and influence. I would have, I wouldn't have predicted that. Um, do you feel like all of this is giving the employee more, for lack of a better word, power when it comes to their <laughs> employment choices? A hundred percent. They're, they're totally in the driver's seat now. And now again, I don't, I want to be like empathetic to, certain people in the industry that are still looking because there's there are small chunks within my industry that still have not found work like you know people that do conference sales right or like events are starting to come back like there's there's certain ones that are i don't want to sit here to say every you know person out there it's it's in your hands but the vast majority of people in my industry especially even in uh medical like rns i mean come on like if you're a nurse how hard is it to find a job? I mean, you can get a job like like that, right? But they definitely have the power. That's that's one hundred percent accurate. And uh, to find candidates right now is is brutal. <laughs> you know, I have a team of recruiters, and we used to be able to tell clients, "You'll see four to five candidates within five business days." Now I say, if I send you a candidate, you have to act quick because I'm oh. sending them to other clients as well. Oh, and wow. I can't promise you that I will send you. I'm not even I'm not even asking for exclusivities now. So like with recruiters you want exclusivity so you're the only recruiter working with that client. But I don't want to like oversell and say I'm going to 100% fill this position for you and then handcuff them to an exclusivity and they're not able to fill the position. So I don't feel like it's fair for me to ask for that now. That's how crazy competitive it is. I just want to be a partner and say, hey, if I find somebody within my time working these other searches, I'll send them your way. That's how like super competitive the candidate market is right now. It's interesting to hear how it's changed your business as well. How has it changed leadership styles from what you've observed? Is there any shift in um, making those different or more up to date? They have to, because that old school like style that I was talking about earlier is gone. You know, there's like an analogy um, that I'll use in in uh, I, I, as you know, I watch a lot of hockey, so here is <laughs> Tampa Bay Lightning. Right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll do a hockey analogy, and we call it well, we the hockey world calls the new coaches players coaches, and what that means is. Um, the player's coach is that empathetic coach, right? So back in the day, if a player did something selfish or stupid, or there was some bad defensive play, the coach would probably embarrass them in front of media, call their name out, go in the locker room, berate them, drop F-bombs, maybe throw a chair across the room. I mean, that's like the culture in hockey was very brutal. It's very tough guy. I mean, you can tell by your stereotype of hockey, like all the fights, you know, it's like, that's the, that's just the culture. Um, and then there's a new wave of coaches, like, like the, the lightning coach, for instance, is a player's coach. He was one of the first ones that had that like term. And they are the kind of coaches that will like, if there's a bad play, you'll see him like kind of lean in and there's the player's bench and he'll like whisper in their ear and like, kind of pull back. He'll like kind of pat their back and say something quiet. He'll never, ever, ever, ever call anybody out in media ever. Even if they have a bad game, it's well. We had a goose egg, you know, and then he'll like fluff it up. Like there's none of that like negative talk. They'll do like team dinners, yoga, yoga on the beach, that kind of stuff. Right. Like stuff that like the old school would kind of be like scoff at. Right. But yeah. guess what happened? We won back to back Stanley Cups and we're we've been in playoffs like the 10 straight years. Right. We're always in like division champions. Like that's what it takes now to motivate the younger generation. And they tune out the screaming and the leading by fear, right? Because that's how I used to be managed. I, I had bosses that led by fear. Hmm. And I think that now uh, the employers that want to retain their talent, they need to have a ton of empathy. 
and they have to genuinely try. I mean, it's not, you can't teach that, but you have to be aware and you have to try. And uh, that's the kind of shift that I'm seeing now. And I'm having these conversations with leaders that are genuinely asking me, what the hell is going on? Like, what am I, what do I got to do? And I go, well, honestly, you have to, you have to care and yeah. you have to understand like some of your employees, you know, they might have a mother at home they're taking care of. They might have daycare they're trying to situate. They're, 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 there's reasons why, you know, some of these hours are grueling. I mean, what, whatever the case may be, I can rant on it forever about it, but empathy is probably the biggest thing that they need to have. So it sounds like that, what you're calling the old school style of, you know, we'll just call it verbal abuse and, <laughs> um, you know, hazing, it seems a little hazing-ish to me. Uh, it seems like that approach, it's not that it was more effective. This other approach is obviously working in the example of the hockey team that you gave, but it also seems like it's, it's not the people that are complaining about the younger generation and well in my day I just got yeah you know yelled at and they said I could swallow my spit if I was thirsty like it's almost like <laughs> <laughs> that may or may not be a real quote from my mother um but it, it, it <laughs> it's just like it's it's not that the person saying that really thinks that that's the best way to lead it's that they're just doing what they saw and so now oh, there's yeah. a different set of yeah. potential I, I think you're onto something there. I think some of it has to do too where they're like the product of their environment. Yeah. And it's like, well, I got beat up, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm stressed out and this is how I'm going to unleash. Like, and a lot of it was like very show offy. Like, I'm not going to call out like old empo employers, but like, I've seen it. I've seen it. Like I, I've had directors or management that were really cool one-on-one, -on -one, but once the boss is in, the area, they have to show off how tough they are, you know, all the time. And, you know, they'd have to speak up and try to berate you and in front to make the boss think that they're tough. Like that is like, that's like a real, it's like a real thing in the industry. I mean, like, I'm not making it up. I mean, if it's even in the mainstream, you look at like Hell's Kitchen, right? Yeah. Like that stuff's real. Like that's not just for camera. Like I talked to chefs that talk all the time that told me about knives flying across the room, pots and pans getting chucked at them. I mean, that's like, that's like real, that's like real life. That, I can't even, I don't, ugh, I can't even it's real. imagine that. Yeah, I mean, I know weird. that you're, you know, I know you're true. You're saying the truth, but it's just so crazy. Okay. So here's these, this is my neck. My last two questions is action oriented. So we've got employers and employees. So can you give us some tips? Like if, if you're, let's say there's a listener right now listening and they, um, would like to leverage this power to their advantage so that they can have a better quality of life. What things can they do now, whether it's in the hiring process or perhaps they're already hired that they could not do before? Yeah, um, I think salary negotiation is something that they have a lot of power in now where before it's like you just get the, the offer and you take it or leave it, right? And now I'm just, negotiations are like every day to, to, <laughs> to, to my dismay because now I'm back and forth. Like I have to, when I, when I talk to a candidate, I'm, I'll ask them, like, look, Meredith, tell me what your salary range is. And I don't care what you're making now. I don't care what you made in the past. Just tell me if I was to offer you position, what your range is, because I don't, I don't want to do the song and dance with you at the end. I really don't tell me, tell me what you, what you need, what you want. And that's what I'm going to pitch to the client. Right. And then some clients, some of them will say, well, I don't think that they're worth X, Y, Z. And I'll say, well, I mean, it's like the housing market, right? The market dictates this. If you want Meredith, and you don't want to dance around a counter offer with her, you need to pay her or she's not available. And that's the kind of stuff that I didn't really have the ability to do as much. I mean, I did, but it's so easy now. I mean, now it's like you have to say it because the candidate's not going to be there. Right. So yeah, that I'd say salary negotiation is probably Are there one of the, uh, yeah. Are there other negotiating factors, like say if someone's employed right now and they're not within that three month period of, 
you know, uh, the honeymoon phase where they're working with the headhunter or perhaps they found the job on their own, but they're, they're outside of that three month window. Do they still have, do you feel leverage to say, Hey boss man, um, you know, I would really like to travel the country next year. Can I work remotely? For example, are the, are there other negotiable aspects of outside of salary for someone who has been employed for more than three months? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, I mean, my, my industry uh, working remote is not as, as possible as it is in other industries because you have to be physically at the location most of the time. I mean, sales managers don't and HR doesn't have to be, and there's other ones, but for the most part, right, there's some that have to be at property to, to, to get a paycheck and to, to work. But, um, I think uh, the PTO or earned hours and, and maybe negotiating um, maybe some some time off for for traveling. I mean, I think that like those kind of things are conversations that are easier now because retention is like a word that I'm hearing just as much as recruiting right now. Now, now they're like, well, we got to retain these people. We can hire them. And now we got to keep them. Right. Because if we lose them, think about the money we're going to lose. Right. So. I think the candidates just have to, or employees in that case, have to realize that they're they're valuable now, um, and, th- and these properties and these restaurants can't run without them. It's it's impossible. So they're able to to speak up and say it in a professional way. I th- uh, yeah, I think that if you're working for a good employer, it's something that is much easier now than it was before. And what about for the employers? What can employers do to attract good candidates and retain them? I mean, most of that is going to be like word of mouth. Um, Social media is huge. They have to be really involved with the community. Um, But when it comes to attracting talent, like working with your bench that you currently have, and working to have them be your best salesperson to get new talent to come in is important uh, to get people who are not aware of your company. You know, again, social media is probably the smartest thing they could do and be on most platforms. Uh, have fun with it. Don't be so dry. Really try to show the fun and culture. Stop with these like job descriptions that are very cut and paste, dry, boring job descriptions. Really just try to sell your company more instead of telling them you need this, you need this, you need this, you need this and that and that and that to come work for me. Instead, you know, why do you want to come work for us? Because we are this and we're awesome at that. And this is what we do for the community. And so Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. That reminds me of, I'm sure you're familiar with Simon Sinek. No, no. Oh, I feel terrible that I don't. It's okay. No, he, you, you'll love him. So just maybe put a book or two of his on your Amazon book list. But, um, he, so he says, start with why. And that, that's one of the things that he kind of touts and he's, he's a consultant for work culture and he also consults for, um, Canadian and U S and British militaries and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, but starting with why I think that's really, really good. Well, we are about out of time. Is there any other thoughts you want to leave with us before we wrap up? Yeah, I guess maybe I want to dig a little, just a hair into like, I know I was being pretty brutal about the work culture in my industry Obviously, I've been in my industry for a long time and I do love it. And I think it's one of the best industries to be a part of. I'm very bullish on it or else I could have left. I think the reason I'm just really trying to bring the negative to light is because it needs to be said, right? But I also don't want to take away from a lot of the amazing companies out there and the industry that I love. I I mean, I grew up in it. I'm not, I'm who I am today because of it, right? But I learned and I grew and I evolved. And that's what a lot of people have to do. Well, that's well said. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see how we evolve, how our work culture affects our home culture, and that we start to see each other as whole people and not as um, segmented, compartmentalized people. Because that's not how humans are. We're way more like a, a plate of spaghetti than a plate of waffles. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell people where they can stay in touch with you if they um, want to know more and glean more of your wisdom? Oh, well, you can find me on YouTube. My name, Jeremy Nichols. 
that's all you gotta search. Really boring name for my channel, just my name. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on there. Jeremy Nichols, again, can't miss this beard. Um, <laughs> I'm on the other platforms, but like I really hang out on LinkedIn most of the okay. time and occasionally on Twitter and Facebook and IG, but yep. Perfect. That's where you can find me. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, you're still here. That's awesome. I hope to see you next week too. I talk with the most interesting people that you've probably never heard of. Most of them are paradoxical and bring an opportunity for you to grow as a person. So if you like bright, meaningful entertainment, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.